So um, I'm going to start. I've deliberately ran over time. It's great to see everybody here. Um, it's myself and um, my colleague Pete. So uh, Pete, do you want to introduce yourself to say a quick hello? Hi, oh, yeah. So uh, Pete Measy. Uh, yeah, and I work together. Um, hopefully we're going to have a really good webinar over the next hour or so. Great. Okay. So um, I just want to do a, a quick kind of recap so we're all up to speed. And, and thanks again to everyone for showing up this week. Um, so we're focusing on this sort of bigger conversation around business agility, which is why I wanted to bring Pete along. I don't pretend to be the genius when, uh, uh, when it comes to the bigger conversation. My area of expertise is very much around the people side um, of things. And so last week we were talking about how um, our organizations are starting to move from the left of this infographic to the right. And the left broadly is about the more traditional hierarchical model uh, that's, you know, in a kind of mode of operating, of, which is all about not losing. So, you know, looking at competitive threats and, and retaining market share and, and, and holding on to a degree to some stuff that we've done in the past. And I've used General Motors as an example there, selling cars up to the 2008 global financial crisis that nobody really wanted. Um, and so we're moving towards the sort of right-hand side of this model. And the right-hand side is, is much more about um, organizations with a higher purpose, more creative kind of structure, um, much more uh, uh, adept at dealing with the challenges of uh, like the universe and everything, and generally are, are much more proactive about how they look after their people. And the example that I gave was uh, Herb Kelleher and Southwest Airlines. You know, so uh, I think you know most people think that the right hand side is populated by tech companies with young, windswept, and interesting entrepreneur leaders. When the truth of the matter is, some of these principles have been around for forty years. And Herb Kelleher, um, as I said last week basically said business is simple. We look after our staff, number one, really well. We love and care about them. As a consequence of that, when our customers come in the door, they have a really great time. And because they have a really great time, they keep coming back. And because they keep coming back, we make money and the shareholders are happy. It's not a great enduring mystery. That's just how business is. There's a very different model though to the model on the left, which is more about shareholder maximization. So that was pretty much us last week. And then I did touch on the fact that these models um, also sit in the context, and that is a societal context, which is actually what's happening with COVID-19. There's a big transformation in society about how we operate, particularly if this goes on for more than three months. Um, and that's to do with habit and change, which we'll be discussing next week. But predominantly, a lot of organizations are sitting in this kind of red area, um, sort of traditional hierarchical model, um, you know, where it's there's some innovation there and accountability, accountability and so on. Profit very much is the um, main motive to keep the shareholders happy. But many are, are starting to move towards this kind of green band, which is more about an empowered culture, the importance of culture of a strategy, being lean or agile, being more flexible and so on and so forth. And that's the purpose of this conversation today. One of the things I promised in um, the information that I sent through on this infographic about what we cover over five weeks uh, is the five lessons we've learned over the past 22 years. So I wanted just to handle that quickly, just so everybody knows that we are people of our word and we deliver what we say we do. And then I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to Pete. And this is an open conversation. So please use the, the uh, chat box and the Q&A box to ask any questions throw in different opinions, neither Pete or I think that we know all the answers uh, to everything in the world of Agile. And what I've found over the last few weeks is people have thrown in um, some tips and tricks, their own personal uh, views. And what it does is it helps enlighten me and stuff that I don't know as well as I should. So um, the top five lessons, very briefly. Um, uh, now this Mick, Come as a no-brainer today, but remember we've been dealing with this is the kind of stuff we've been dealing with for a few years now. So, um, adopting a two-year plan for an agile transformation will fail in a VUCA world. Predicting the future is, impo is impossible. And really, what we we've, we've learned is that we understand that for our C-suite um, uh, leaders, 
there's a massive pressure to do something big and to be seen to do something big to change the organization. The problem is, is that none of us can, can say how the world will be in two years' time. And these big kind of transformation projects um, rarely, if ever, deliver what they promise. Now, that's not my words, but the words of uh, Peter Senge, um, the great systems theorist, and his very large network of change agents and transformation coaches and CEOs and so forth. So um, don't try and do a big two-year plan. Chunk it into small chunks uh, is a solution. Um, senior leadership sponsorship, sponsorship, collaboration, belief is critical to sec success as all business areas are impacted. So I'm sure pretty much everyone in this group has seen um, situations where one part of the business, usually technology, starts working in a more agile way. And because the other parts of the business, and I'll just say marketing or, or HR, are not aligned, friction occurs and it becomes really difficult. That senior leadership sponsorship is critical, but change is, is sorry to use this term, um, but it's a, it, it is an important term, is viral, it's peer-to-peer -peer driven. But without that top-down sponsorship, it will fail. And it needs to be a broad sponsorship, but usually one or two individuals will be the key sponsors for the project. Um, there's a growing body of empirical evidence of a traditional top-down approach to change is fatally flawed. Successful behavioral change cannot be dictated from the top, bit of a mouthful. But um, what it's saying is that um, you need support from the top, but the change really happens at the core face. And most change initiatives are a senior team come up with their vision and need it basically broadcast it. That's the equivalent of me shouting out my two girls and telling them to uh, tidy their, their rooms. It, it just doesn't work like that. Um, so I love this quote. So thanks for that, Phil. People don't resist change, they resist being changed. And there's so much wisdom in that. So that's, that's fantastic. I'm going to get a t-shirt with that on, Phil. Thanks for meeting. Um, that is actually the essence of it. Nobody, nobody changes outside in. They change inside out. Now, how does that happen? A lot of it happens based on everything that I've taught over the last three weeks about our social brain, how we watch our peers and we copy our peers, how the, um, the Trojan horse part of our brain means we, 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 we start bringing in the beliefs and behaviors of other people and take them as our own, you know, blah, blah, blah. So although that's very, very funny, it's also very wise. The truth of the matter is, is that if you want genuine, successful, long-lived change in organizations, we need to have a fundamentally different model. Um, and that is this idea of peer-driven change supported from the top. Now, this is a big one. If we treat people like owners, this is um, the words of um, Laszlo Bock, the old um, senior vice president of people and operations for Google. And so if we treat people like owners, as we do in Agile, by sort of this idea of a bounded autonomy, then productivity, engagement, and collaboration improve almost immediately. Um, so I don't think I need to say anything more than that. And then the other one is demand early proof of success and build on it. That's not just important for senior leaders. This is important for everyone. The team, when team members see that stuff is really working, it builds belief, it builds confidence, and it builds um, what I would call volition, the desire to keep doing more and keep achieving more. Now, every single person that I know who has seen this working says that it's almost magical. When you see it working, you can literally feel it. Teams that would normally take six to nine months to do stuff are doing it in three or four weeks. Um, and it's really, a lot of it's to do with the, the, the human mechanics as well as having the good tools around uh, as well. And, and that's the perfect bridge really uh, to talk about well, what the hell do we mean about the tools? What is this business agility shenanigans anyway? So I'm going to stop sharing and um, let Pete start sharing. Now, as we do this handover in the, in the chat box, any observations, um, any thoughts from the gang that are here with us today? Okay. Just give that a few seconds because it 
normally takes uh, so thanks Craig um, agree with those five lessons I think all of us who've been in the trenches a bit uh, have all suffered with what I call the bag, big bang um, theory and that is we need to do a big bang and like we're all blaming you know they, it gets complex and it gets difficult to manage all the pieces and and people at, at their hearts just aren't brought into it but because they're employees they, they go along with it because their jobs are dependent on it so we get compliance what we don't get is a real kind of passionate um, kind of uh, involvement but when you get initial teams there could be 10 initial teams but if you get initial teams that are really passionate it, it has a, a what we call a you know a, a, a second order effect and that second order effect is their their peers around them start getting interested so thanks for that i appreciate that um all right pete over to you great okay thanks al so welcome to uh everybody gonna have a look through uh, business agility specifically thinking about uh, leadership implications of business agility so just to move on um i think we've got the uh, i think we've got the tool sorted out so uh, microphones off uh, raise r either raise a hand or use chat if you want to raise questions i'm going to ask you a few questions as we go through this uh, as we go through this webinar so uh, as i say please please use chat etc a little bit on me um, I used to be uh, CEO of uh, Ratak. I built Ratak uh, since '98. Um, sort of semi-retired about two years ago, a year and a half, two years ago. So they're now called me chairman and founder. Uh, started in '19 around '83. Uh, started in uh, Agile around '94. Certified in all sorts of different stuff. Some of you might have heard uh, heard of a, an Agile approach called DSDM, which is basically morphed into what is now the Agile Business Consortium. Uh, so I used to be a director of that. Uh, wrote the book for the British Computer Society on this sort of stuff, um, uh, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, a fair old uh, background in uh, Agile, fair old background in information technology, and also a, a pretty good understanding of business. Um, so why business agility? Um, well, we've mentioned this term, Al mentioned this term a few minutes ago, VUCA or VUCA. Um, I'd just like to have a quick look at this. I'm just going to run a short video just so we sort of like got this, what the same idea of VUCA actually is.
So there's a sort of key message there at the end. If the rate of change outside exceeds the rate of change inside, then you've got a big problem. Um, so with that in mind, um, uh, just uh, going on to the chat, I've got here a sort of uh, diagram that talks about low VUCA, so technology, globalization, regulatory, etc., and high VUCA. So just thinking about uh, you folks who are, who are actually on this, uh, who are actually on the call, can you just score up where you think you are on these things? So we'll give you a few minutes to do this and then just put uh, the total that you come up with. So score up each of these different areas, low or high VUCA in your, in your market for your business. And then just put a score on the uh, uh, put a score on the um, chat if you would. That'd be great. So while we're doing that, um, just a quick one from Michael um, Freedom Inc. by Isaac Getz and Brian Carney um, is a is a great read about intent based leadership. Um, so and and that is you know analogous to to treating employees like owners. So intent based leadership. So Freedom Inc, I'm just going to nod that down. I am a relentless reader. Um, so thanks for that, Michael. Just give everyone a couple more minutes. Are you nipping forwards and backwards in the slides there? Yeah, I went forwards too uh, accidentally. So I've gone back to the... Uh, <laughs> uh, right, we've already got a, one score, about a three to four by Roger. So thanks for that. Overall, so I, I, either a three to four type score, or alternatively, just a total of whatever your scores were. But both of those are good. Yeah, well, I've got a four as well. It's like we're uh, most of us are working in a pretty high VUCA world for for another four. Yeah, yeah, that is that is interesting, Stephen as well. Yeah, thanks for that. So looking like we're getting a, a fair old Craig as well. Yeah, this, this yeah. is some, what we'd a, fair number of, a fair number of fours. Okay, cool. So, right, so we've seen some uh, sort of like uh, the same sort of numbers coming out there. So that's absolutely brilliant. So thanks very much for that. So let's, um, let's keep driving forward a little bit. So we're all agreeing that we're in a pretty VUCA world. That would certainly be our experience as well. Uh, it's very much um, a, VUCA, a VUCA world, especially compared to the way it was back in, the, back, back, back in the day. So let's keep pushing forward. So key drivers of change, uh, emerging technologies. These are a biggie within business. Uh, people, uh, digital disruptors, uh, there's loads of uh, digital, digital disruptors out there. Obviously, the danger to existing businesses is uh, they think they're perfectly safe in their, in their world uh, until um, a digital disruptor, disruptor comes in from left field and totally takes their business out. I mean, how many times has that happened over the last 10 to 15 years? Globalization, obviously, uh, and nature of work. Um, nature of work has changed significantly. So there's lots of key drivers of change why we've moved into this, more into this uh, uh, VUCA world. Uh, and obviously the nightmare we're going through at the moment, uh, yeah, I mean, back in the day, only a couple of months ago, we would be talking to CEOs, CIOs, CDOs, CMOs, etc., and they would be thinking this, digital transformation is many years away, it's not going to affect us. Well, yeah, it will. Um, some of you may have read a book called uh, a guy called Taleb called Black Swans. Uh, the idea of the Black Swan is there are events that don't happen very often, but they will definitely happen. Uh, and it's about making sure your business is structured to to deal with those to deal with those uh, things that turn up. So uh, over to you again. If we can just go on to chat again, uh, what are the top challenges you face uh, when transforming to anything really? But uh, if you were thinking of transforming to a business agility style of working. What would be the top challenges you face? So if you can, if you could just raise some points on chat, that'd be absolutely brilliant. And um, if you're in the consulting world, then what are the sort of typical challenges that you see over and over again? That, that would be uh, equally enlightening. <laughs> yep, <laughs> loss aversion, unwillingness to change definitely. Leadership engagements uh, always a big one. Beliefs of top management, yeah, beliefs are always a big aren't they? Cultural change, yeah. The frozen middle, as it's called from Phil, there usually in middle management, the frozen middle. The word transformation, absolutely. So you know, it's sort of suggests it's too big. Yeah, I'd agree with that one. Yeah. Uh, defining the challenge, communicating the challenge, absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah, you're, you're definitely aligning with our experience here. C-suite silos. Collaboration gaps between the silos, yeah, especially if you're talking large companies. 
culture of the organization, too much top-down management, lack of, lack of trust. That's a huge one. Uh, you're not going to get any uh, effective teams working if there's not a trust environment. And change fatigue. Yeah, I remember I was working for a major airline in their engineering department 25, 30 years ago. I was talking to the CEO of that engineering department um, and we were discussing change, transformational change. And uh, he said, well, we've got some really key things that we need to do in the airline, the airline engineering business at the moment. I said, that's interesting. Well, what, what are those key things? Um, 45 minutes later, he had described to me 96 number one priorities. Oh, 96. So yeah, change fatigue. <laughs> so key challenge, yeah, anchored in old styles of working. Um, I'm sure you've heard of a guy called Professor John Cotter. He talks about anchoring, anchoring change in the culture. So yeah, fantastic. Helping people get comfortable with the idea that change is a constant. Confucius, famous saying from Confucius, change is the only constant, absolutely. Value streams are often crossed organization boundaries, absolutely. So we need to make sure that we're aligning to systems thinking and value, change, uh, value streams, sorry. Yeah, fantastic stuff. That's a really great, uh, really great. And I put a people spin on this as well. I think, I think one of the things we'll talk about next week about change is I'll, I'll explain the mechanics of, of change in human beings because um, for all of us, change is, is threatening. And, and that's why you get either inertia or resistance and, and many of the things that are, are spoken about here. But um, I, I think these are, are brilliant observations. So we will talk a little bit about that next week. But, but yeah, these are fantastic. Yeah, absolutely fantastic stuff. So let's just have a look at, um, um, some of you may have heard of something called the Agile, uh, Annual State of Agile Report. This comes from one of the tooling operators called version one of the Agile tooling operators. Um, if you get a chance to register this, I would register for this. I would recommend it. Uh, just basically go onto the version one site, register to be a participant in the annual, annual State of Agile Report, and you will get the report. So this, this is from the 13th one. Uh, top benefits, so top benefits of um, going towards an Agile business. We'll talk about this in more detail, but I'll, I'll not read them out. You can see them on the slide there. And then top challenges, yeah, sort of aligning with exactly what you were just saying there. So uh, brilliant stuff. So this is aligning with your thoughts as well. So great stuff. Yeah, so just a, a couple of other comments, Pete. We've got uh, Chris just saying that, you know, often the value streams are understandably cutting across organizational boundaries, but the organizational functions themselves are not pulling in the same direction. Yeah, <laughs> um, and then control mindset versus a collaboration mindset. That's from Craig. Uh, that's actually a very succinct and important um, point. You know, um, I think that senior leaders are still very embedded in a control mindset, fear-based mindset, because they have to, you know, re report to the market. For example, if you're in a big corporation, um, so it is a big, it's a big change, which is why we spend before we do anything, we spend time with the C-suite. Back to you, Pete. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at something called the leadership myth later on, which is a self-sustaining downward cycle going down the plug hole. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that which uh, that person just commented on. So yeah, again, fantastic comments. Greatly appreciated. Um, this is again from the uh, annual state uh, of Agile report. Again, I'm not planning to read this out. Um, it's really looking at the benefits of adopting Agile. Now, the interesting thing for me here, you know, having spent, uh, what, whatever since 1994 to now is, so I've been working in the Agile arena since 94, however long that is. This certainly aligns with my experience. Um, in essence, what this is showing is people replying, a couple of thousand people replying to the uh, Agile, uh, State of Agile report. I'm basically saying, where were the biggest benefits? Um, now, I can see down the bottom there, project cost reduction. Well, we may or may not be running projects in Agile, but uh, in my experience, it would be significantly larger. But uh, yeah, benefits of adopting Agile, worth having a look at the annual state of Agile survey. So that's really thinking about why do we need business agility? Well, we're in a VUCA world, uh, the world's changed. Uh, how do we get where we are now? So how do we get to use the current systems that we use in business? Well, I'm sure some of you, all of you will have heard of a concept called Taylorism. Um, your industrial revolution, mass production, incredibly effective way of managing business. So it's thinking of business as a machine, basically, very command and control. Uh, you are working on the business production line. You need to do these things, and I will manage you to make sure that you do these things. So that was incredibly effective during the Industrial Revolution and just afterwards. Um, we need to ask ourselves, in a VUCA world, is that a very effective way to work? Well, no, <laughs> it's the answer to that. Uh, we then came into the information age. So management as a science, so um, thinking about the Toyota production system, thinking about lean, all this sort of good stuff. 
uh, re-engineering. Um, I used to I used to work in uh, process re-engineering 25, 30 years ago. Waterfall, sort of like Tayloristic styled approach, knowledge workers, this sort of stuff. So the information age driving business. We then moved into where we are now. Uh, so this is really where the highly successful businesses are, are placed now, the age of the team. So we don't really work through the traditional lines into markets. We work through networks of people. Um, the, the larger, more succinct and focused our networks are, then we can get the sorts of messages out. Uh, this aligns to, I'm sure some of you have heard of Frank Kearns, um, intent-based branding. So making sure that we have an intentional brand and that brand is going out there through our networks of people. So we're representing ourselves in the way we want to. Communities of customers, employees, um, making sure that um, we treat our employees right, making sure that uh, our employees would promote us, net promoter scores, all that sort of good stuff. Uh, and also customers. Um, if we're treating our employees right, then um, hopefully they will treat our customers right. Um, leader as the steward of the community. So very much thinking in the business, in business agility, about um, community of practice. So people who want to raise community of practice and talk about interesting subjects to them, fantastic, that's what we're gonna do. Connection, empathy and impact. Um, it says on this slide, matter, uh, I would say are absolutely essential. Um, most of my experience in selling uh, services, uh, certainly agile services, is people by people. When you're talking about things like training, you talk about uh, things like consultancy. So yeah, connection, empathy, and impact are absolutely essential. Um, we talk about direct marketing, for example. So uh, that's that's to build those to build those channels. Uh, look, quote here from uh, Rob Allen: um, "The current thinking got you here. Only you think it will get you out." So this is the last slide in this section. It's really making the point that you know, got to have a Dylan quote in anything. You know, times aren't a changing. Times have a changed, and they changed sort of 15, 20 years ago. So business nowadays. Um, e even in the days since I formed Radtac in 98, um, interacting with the market and business is significantly different to the way it was 20 years ago. Um, thinking about when I was working in other organisations like British Airways and uh, BT, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah, I mean, business has changed unrecognisably over the last 25, 30 years. So sadly, I think that uh, the situation we're in at the moment with the nightmare COVID, etc., is, has really brought that home to a number of very senior business people that we have to have, we have to have the ability for the business to be agile because if the business is not agile, it can't deal with black swan events. And if the business is not agile, you will, you'll just not be able to compete. So if, the, um, if what is happening uh, inside the business is not aligning to what's happening outside the business, you've got a huge problem. So it looks, we've got a few things on chat here, so I'm just gonna go off to chat. Uh, value streams are often open to have that on control versus collaboration wholeheartedly agree yeah so the collaborative mindset from a leadership perspective it's all about collaboration you know um, I'm sure some of you have heard the term uh, theory x and theory y management very very quickly theory x management is basically where the manager thinks everybody who works for them is an idiot and they're just trying to pull the wool over the eyes and they've got to be told what to do and they've got to be managed every second of every day. That's a Theory X manager. And if the manager is managing in a Theory X way, that's the way people will operate. So in other words, they'll be right. That's the way people think and operate. Theory Y, a Theory Y leader, um, is somebody who thinks the people who work with them are absolutely brilliant, fantastic human beings. And basically what the Theory Y person needs to do is just enable those human beings to be brilliant and then basically get out the bleeding way. So yeah, Agile is much more about theory Y leadership than theory M management. Um, yeah, fantastic, someone's just ducking out there. So uh, thanks very much for coming along. So and, Craig, uh, I'll, I'll send you the video as usual. So we send all of the, uh, the recordings out, usually by the Friday, because it takes a, a, a wee while to crunch and uh, get, get set up into YouTube. So um, thank you very much for coming along. Back to you. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we've looked at uh, business agility, um, why we need it, um, and we've also uh, had a look at some other stuff. Let's now have a look at uh, our experience. So leadership behaviors. So this is business agility in the context of uh, agile leadership. So what sort of leadership behaviors should we have in place to enable business agility? Now, all of this is RATAX experience. It's not from books, it's not from, um, it's not from anything else, white papers or whatever. This is our experience built up over 22 years of actually doing this stuff on the ground uh, globally. 
So all of this is, is really RATAC IP. But before we get here, before we actually start talking about uh, agile operating models, just a, key, a quick exercise again, if we can get back on chat. Um, in your experience, what should the key leadership behaviors be to enable an agile? Well, let me just explain what an agile operating model is. <laughs> um, all businesses obviously have a business operating model, the way they operate, the way they interact with their people, the way they interact with the markets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, an agile operating model is basically um, how we make sure that we have business agility in place. Now, you might have a business operating model within which certain parts of the business are operating with an agile operating model, or the whole business might have an agile operating model. Um, our experience over the last 10, 12 years of doing this, um, specifically talking to businesses about business agility, is many, many businesses now are moving out of having an agile operating model just in IT or just in marketing or HR. Uh, and they're actually creating their whole business to be agile, so true business agility. So if we can get back on chat and just think about key leadership behaviors to enable an agile operating model, that would be awesome. So clear accountability, yeah, absolutely, absolutely key. I'm sure some of you have heard of Lencioni, uh, Patrick Lencioni. If uh, I would suggest have a look at Patrick Lencioni's book, if uh, uh, thinking about accountability, trust. Yeah, brilliant stuff. You've got to have tr trust. If you look at Lencioni's um, um, pyramid, basically trust is the foundation of everything that we do. Setting clear outcomes, not tasks. Definitely agility talks about, you know, outcome-based delivery. Uh, we're talking about uh, stories. Some of, you, some of you will have heard of, surely. Product owners, yeah, all aiming towards outcomes. Trust, definitely. Autonomous teams that leverage the collective intellect and creativity. Again, definitely. So aiming towards value change, going down towards value rather than separate component teams, so definitely. Executive sponsorship, yeah, absolutely key. We need to make sure that um, uh, typically when you do a transformation, you aim to get some tangible empirical data by uh, changing one vertical slice of the business. You then take that empirical data, that real world data, up to the senior management, prove to them that this change is happening, and then basically you do a, you do a pincer movement on the middle management. It's normally the middle management, in our experience, that's the more, most difficult to uh, start to transform. So, uh, yep, how to get that executive sponsorship. Collaboration key, absolutely key. We'll talk about that. Co-creating objectives, boundaries, and strategies. Again, yep, in the agile world, you know, we don't really have this idea of, hey, the management are going to push down these ideas and objectives and boundaries, and then you must do this. Everybody's involved in this. Everybody's involved in it, the holistic business. Willingness to prioritise is absolutely key. As I say, the story from the airline, one of the airlines I used to work for back in the day, 96 priority one things in their uh, in their change programme. Uh, amazingly, that didn't work. Probably no great surprise. <laughs> um, so just uh, just a, a, a quick um, link back to some of the stuff that we've covered. Um, so in the neuroscience of team, David Rock's uh, SCARF model uh, status and the autonomy relatedness, which is uh, belonging and fairness, um, would support everything that's that's being raised here that the kind of behaviors that agile have, have, have kind of stumbled upon through trial and error uh, I think science is basically catching up with with uh, agile and yeah. saying oh well these things are actually quite important you know so so it's it's wonderful to see these points being made yeah absolutely 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 great stuff so yeah thanks thanks again for that so I'm going to ask you to do some more stuff as we as we keep going through as well Here's some um, things that we've learned over the last uh, 20, 22, 20, 30 years or so. Um, yeah, so these are leadership behaviors that in our experience enable an, agile, enable an agile operating model. So number one, stop starting, start finishing. Uh, what we mean by that is that businesses and teams and human beings find it very easy to start stuff. So as we start to do something, we hit a blocker or we hit some sort of problem, we think, oh, you know, crap, we can't do that anymore. Uh, I'll tell you what, we'll put that on the back burner. Uh, and we'll start something else. So we've now got two things going, and then we hit another problem and say, so, oh, right, okay. Then we've now got three things going, then four, then five, then six, then seven. This leads to a huge amount of context and task switching. Uh, I'm sure most of the people who are uh, on the webinar today know that context and task switching is basically the least, predict predictive, the least productive way you can work. If you want to have a look at that, just look at Tinterweb. There's loads of stuff on context and task switching and why it's a really bad thing. So. What we need to do is stop starting new stuff and start finishing what we're doing now. So in the perfect world, we start something, finish it. Now we start something, finish it. Start, finish, start, finish, start, finish, start, finish. This is very much aligned to flow-based thinking 
and a transformation framework called Kanban, for those of you who've heard of Kanban. So numero uno in an agile operating model, stop starting, start finishing. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the big focuses of uh, Scrum Masters, some of you might have heard of, or Agile coaches, these, these sorts of folks, the people who are in essence there to facilitate and coach the organization and the teams to be the best that they can possibly be. A real focus of those sorts of roles is uh, uh, sh short feedback cycles. If we're working in a VUCA world, we've got to make sure that we're aligning to that VUCA world. The only way we can do that is by getting feedback from the market. So what we need to do is create small increments of value in business agility, get those small increments of value out there and get feedback on them. Then we can ascertain, are we going the right direction or not? Uh, if we're not going the right direction, we can basically change direction. So that's another key thing, another key leadership behavior we want to have in place to enable the Agile operating model. Next one, a uh, quote here from, uh, well, it's debatable who this quote is actually from, but I always think Eisenhower, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. So, you know, the point that Eisenhower's making here is uh, planning, the process of planning is going to help us think about the direction of travel we need to go. However, in Eisenhower's world, as soon as you get into a theatre of war, forget your plan, check it out the window. So, you know, that definitely has an implication in a VUCA world. So we need to enable agile planning, um, focus on enabling predictability um, and gender baseline and commitment plan thinking. So what I mean there by baseline and commitment plan thinking is um, we would only think in detail, we would only plan in detail for the next very short period, uh, maybe up to four weeks, more typically two weeks, what you would sometimes call an iteration or a sprint. We're only going to be thinking over a short period of time because we're working in a world that's volatile and certain, complex and ambiguous. So short period of time. Does that mean that we don't plan further out? No, absolutely. It does not mean we don't plan for it. You do plan further out. Uh, from experience, if you're running a business, uh, you can't just look over the next two weeks. You need to be looking down the road, two months, three months, six months, whatever makes sense in the environment that you're working. However, when you plan over that time period, we need to do it at a very, very high level. It's not detailed planning, it's very high level. So plans are worthless, but planning and everything. Planning is everything, sorry. Fourth thing we've learned really about agile operating models, um, we need to engender a focus on continuous delivery of maximum value independent business outcomes. So as our friend on the chat earlier said, very, very focused on business outcomes. We need to get that cultural behavior mode, that leadership behavior mode in place. So small uh, outcomes, concentrating on the greatest value, prioritizing the greatest value, uh, stop starting, start finishing, and get continuous delivery in place. So we're always delivering maximum value business outcomes. So the, the market has always experienced great value coming from us. That's another, another key leadership behavior. Sure, everything's business value focused. Yep, uh, there's more to ordering a sequence of delivery. There is more to ordering a sequence and delivery than just what is the highest business value, very typically in most businesses. Um, many agile teams use a concept called CD3, uh, which I'm sure some of you will have heard of. CD3 is a, a concept called cost of delay over either effort or duration or whatever makes sense. Cost of delay, there's numerous ways to define that, but cost of delay is very typically defined as business value plus, so business value as we said here, business value plus timing value plus risk reduction and opportunity enablement over effort. So there's, there is a gazillion different ways to put a, a backlog of uh, change uh, in an order. Um, business value is obviously a very, very key driver, but there are, other, there are other things as well that need to come in play. So again, another key leadership behavior, everything has an order. And um, implement processes and tools. So as leaders, we need to implement processes and tools that enable plan on cadence release on demand. So what I mean by that is whenever we're thinking about planning as a leader, that's cool. You know, we can do the detailed planning for the next couple of weeks. We can do high level baseline planning, looking out over whatever period makes sense for the business. That's fantastic. We can do those plans, but understand that uh, the plans need to be on a cadence. The way we work in agile is we um, use empirical thinking. Now empirical thinking is basically making decisions based on uh, factual evidence. Uh, I'm not an expert scientist, but my understanding of science is that uh, it's empirical. In other words, in science, you have theoretical physicists, for example, Einstein. You have uh, experimental physicists, for example, Faraday. So there's two different branches. Einstein would come up with a theory, and then basically everyone would try and disprove the theory. 
Uh, if you look at quantum physics, for example, that theory was defined in the early 1900s, hasn't been disproved yet. So that is probably a fact. But who knows, somebody might disprove it next week. So empirical thinking, planning on cadence, if we use a standard time period, so we are always doing two week sprint plans, let's say, it's always two weeks, we have that standard heartbeat of two weeks. It means we can look into the past to predict what's gonna happen in the future. We can look at what we've been able to do in previous two week periods of time or time boxes. We can look at what we've done in previous two week time boxes and we can make a prediction of what's gonna happen in future two week time boxes. So plan on cadence. However, they are just plans, release on demand. So we might release every half day, we might release every hour, every day, every two days, we might release every week, we might release at the end of the uh, sprint plan, we might release after two or three sprints. So we need to understand as a leader, and we need to get that behavior mode into place, that we need to plan on cadences, however we're gonna release at the point the customer pulls that value. So you came up with some fantastic stuff. This is what uh, we've sort of learned over the last 20, 25 years or so. Um, brilliant. So let's have a look at another one. So that, that was an agile operating model. Uh, let's have a look at uh, sorts of things we would need to set, uh, set up a business agility environment, a business agility culture. So again, over to you. What should the key leadership behaviors be to enable a business agility environment or culture? So once again, if you'd be kind enough to raise uh, points on chat, that would be absolutely fantastic. So while that's happening, um, we had a couple more points came in while you were talking, Pete. So from uh, Phil, psychological safety is important and a belief that no one will be punished or humiliated for coming up with new ideas, questions, concerns, um, or, or more importantly, making mistakes, right? So this whole idea of uh, fail fast. I think that um, what's been interesting and what's gonna transform all our worlds, uh, to go back to the point about empiricism, is that um, we're starting to, to get a much clearer empirical understanding of what makes teams tick and what makes individuals tick and then what makes teams of teams tick um, from neuroscience and uh, social cognitive neuroscience particularly. Um, so I think that for the first time we're starting to map the human system if you want to use that term, uh, whereas it was much easier to map the business systems. Um, so we, we definitely live in interesting times. So what's been raised, raised by um, attendees so far um, is, is certainly supported by the evidence of the science thus far as well. Uh, de definitely, I mean the science is basically saying that you know, Taylorism, nothing wrong with Taylorism back in the Industrial Revolution, great stuff. So you know, treating people and businesses as machines back in the day, just to reiterate, that went through the information age and we're now in the team age. So all of these things that you're raising on the uh, on the chat are absolutely awesome. Transparency, trust, collaboration, open and honest and transparency, no yeah. one will be still humiliated, fantastic. Ideas, questions, concerns or mistakes, yeah, we want to be innovative and creative. Um, we're not going to get innovative and creative teams unless they uh, unless they feel safe, psychological safety. The way the foundation of setting up the psychological safety is trust. So uh, yeah. Uh, absolutely fantastic stuff. We'll look at a concept called tempered radicals um, in later um, in later webinars. But uh, in essence, building on the uh, the idea of uh, you know making mistakes, etc. A tempered radical is somebody in a business who doesn't think like everybody else does. Um, they are beyond valuable. The, the, those are the people who identify the uh, you know the thing that's coming down the line in the next six months, year, etc. So tempered radicals are something that's key. We want those people within an agile team. Brilliant. Interestingly, interestingly, sorry to jump in, Pete. Um, in social physics, um, Alex Pentland talks about having the uh, the individual in the team who's a bit of a, a, a controversial uh, a thinker. So it kind of reinforces that. That's what he's found in terms of ensuring diversity of thought and avoiding groupthink. Um, these people are incredibly valuable. So even the science is backing you up there. So that's great. No, no, brilliant stuff. Great stuff. So again, let, let's look at what we've learned over the last uh, uh, couple, of, couple of decades. So building uh, a business agility culture environment. So trust and enable, funnily enough, exactly what you folks were just talking about. Trust and enable the right power to the right people. Um, obviously, you know, um, um, enabling an empowered environment doesn't mean that everybody can make decisions on everything all the time. Uh, a, that would be highly unfair. Um, on people who would get extremely stressed in that environment. Uh, but also we need to make sure that, uh, you know, you can't empower a team, teams empower themselves. So we need to be having a conversation with the team to think about where empowerment should lie. You know, as agileists, we really want the empowerment 
on the coal face with the people talking to the uh, talking, talking to the customer. But we need to think about you know tempering that with uh, reality and thinking about you know what what will put too much uh, stress on people, etc. But in essence, trust and enable the right power to the right people, create a safe environment based on trust, and we've got to get creativity and innovation in place. Create time for pairing. Uh, create what are called specialised generalists. Uh, very quickly, a specialised generalist um, would be someone with specialist skill, let's say uh, a back-end Java developer, let's say, for example. But that back-end Java developer would also have some generalised skills, so they'd understand a bit about business analysis, testing, etc., etc. So that's absolutely key to get the team working together. And in gender environment, continuous learning. Um, certainly, you know, we look in the agile world for continuous learners. It doesn't matter if they're learning continuously about agile or about IT or about business agility or whatever it is, they might be learning about scuba diving, but that's absolutely fantastic. It's showing a mindset of continuous learning. Um, it's showing a mindset that is able to evolve and adapt. So we look for continuous learners. Enable teams to be autonomous, have time to master their role and have a clear purpose. Now, autonomy, mastery, purpose. Some of you might recognize that, Dan Pink. Um, uh, I would highly recommend to the folks on the call if you have a time to, if you have time to read a book called Drive by a dude called Dan Pink good move um, or alternatively if you look on YouTube you'll see a short 10-12 minute uh, overview from Pink about autonomy mastery purpose so this is what the science is showing um, uh, what really engenders teams what gets what gets teams going they need to be autonomous they need to have time to master the role and they need to have a clear sense of the direction of travel purpose co-locate teams where possible or enable virtual co-location tools and processes it's quite an interesting one um, some extremely good agile consultants um, who really understand agile inside out, inside out would absolutely insist that the only way to do agility is to have physically co-located teams um, i think we've just proved with the nightmare of covid that is <laughs> um, we can work very very effectively with virtual co-location and you know radtac have been putting this message over for the last 22 years. Um, which is better? Physical co-location is. That's what the science shows. However, virtual co-location was extremely difficult 20, 15, 20 years ago because the tools were crap. Uh, now, we've got some really, really good tools. So, you know, RADTAC, we're a global organization. We work very effectively with virtual co-location. But we- uh, Can I just jump in on this, Pete, because an important point. Um, so one of the things that, if you, if you went at uh, previous workshops, um, the the method of communication when you're in a virtual team is really important and what i mean by that is slack uh, is great uh, email is great uh, whatsapp and direct messaging is great but the most effective way of um of communicating with teams is on something like zoom or, or, or because because the the subtle social messages that we give um are not picked up by all the other mediums but many of them are picked up through face-to-face -face communication like this. So I can read a lot of Pete's body language, um, his level of energy, and so, and so on. So what I would say to anyone who's got a virtual team, which I do, a lot of my team are in Leeds and a couple in London, the usual thing, is nearly 90% of my communication is via something like this. Just yeah. thought I would throw that in, Pete. That, that, that's definitely our experience. I mean, but back in the day when the, um, you know, the collaboration tools weren't as good, when, when we had people working around the world, you know, India or, or uh, uh, wherever, Poland, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, one of the first things we would always do is, is set up uh, an environment within which they could talk to each other face to face. Um, you know, back in the day, that was VC sort of stuff. But nowadays, the tools are a lot better. And create agile contracts focused on enabling collaboration. Yep, we don't want contracts that are basically enable uh, different parts of uh, you know the suppliers and customers to just beat the crap out of each other basically we want agile contracts so we both win everybody wins enabling collaboration in essence business agility is about producing the best possible outcome in the time and money we have available to us the best possible outcome so continuous delivery of value delivering the best possible outcome that means we all need to work together that's what the contracts uh, are set up agile contracts are very very difficult uh, very very difficult very very different to traditional contracts. Focus HR on resourcing and employing people with an agile mindset, so a continuous improvement mindset, a continuous learner mindset, and reward those agile behaviors. So, probably obvious. Um, let's move on. So, uh, think about the lean agile mindset. Uh, I've just talked about um, uh, that interest, starting to introduce the concept. So, we've talked about the um, uh, model, 
the agile business model and we've talked about business agility environment now let's think about engendering an agile mindset as a leader so you know the uh, the overview i suppose of an agile mindset is with an agile mindset we're not doing agile we're being agile it's just in the nature of the way the business works and the people within the business so over to you because you've been raising such fantastic stuff um, again in chat what should the key leadership behaviors be to enable an agile mindset within the business so again if you could raise some points that would be awesome so if you just in terms of time because uh, we're, we're we're doing pretty well, actually. We've got about eight minutes uh, to one thirty. Yeah. So we, we should get through. Uh, we've got one or two more slides to go through. We should get through those. Yeah. As as always, we've we've deliberately over over egged the pudding, so we've got plenty more we could talk about. And um, Pete's done an amazing job today. Um, so if we don't get through everything, uh, you're running a series of webinars on agile leadership. Is that? Correct in the next week or two. Yeah. So when, um, yeah, the, the last the last slide to look at is uh, when when I'm actually planning to run those. But right. so yeah, we're going to agile leadership in more detail, basically. Um, yeah, cool. All right. So uh, okay, let's just have a look at um, enabling the agile mindset. So I'm not I'm not going to read through all of these. There's two. I think yes, there's two slides here. So I'm just going to talk around them. Um, if you could have a look at uh, what what is on here, I think we're um, a number of the points you've raised. Uh, are sort of coming into this, uh, coming into this arena. Um, focus on optimizing flow. Yep, making sure we get the value, uh, structuring teams to get the value um, uh, to the customer. Yeah, innovation and creativity culture by removing the blame culture. You named that one. You named that one a little bit earlier on, on on the on the on, when you were going into chat. And um, one of the real biggies, agile mindset. You know, when problems occur, as a leader, give the team a damn good listening to. Uh, <laughs> There's, there's a reason why that problem's occurred. So if we don't understand what the reason is, we don't have the trust culture, nobody's ever going to open up. Uh, we need to get people to open up to figure out what the problem really is. And um, my experience tells me over the last 20 years or so that uh, human beings 99.9999% of the time are absolutely brilliant and just want an opportunity to be brilliant. That's what all my experience tells me. Um, in essence, what we need to do is figure out what problems they have as a leader uh, and then basically help them remove those problems. So we're removing blockers, we're removing barriers to enable them to be brilliant. And sadly, I go into organizations sometimes and the people are not brilliant because they've not been allowed to be brilliant or alternatively, they've been treated like numpties, they've been treated you know, like an ex-manager would treat them and they're acting like that. So we need to change that behavior mode. It's one of the really big le leadership uh, behaviors we need to do to get the agile mindset. Um, yeah, provide focus, autonomy, mastery, purpose again. Um, servant leadership, I'm sure some of you or all of you might have heard of the bottom right one here. Great agile leaders serve the team, remove disturbance or noise, provide vision, coach and facilitate. Uh, on the left here, uh, last one to have a look at, remove the overhead of management reporting, um, which can be a huge pain in the arse for everybody. And, uh, you know, nobody ever, if, if they're very long and detailed, nobody ever read them anyway, or certainly I wouldn't when I was a CEO, if they were long. <laughs> um, we, from a management style, we really need to focus on what are called gamble walks. And a gamble walk isn't, isn't just management by walking around. A gamble walk basically means go see, go see where the problem is, and more, more importantly, help deal with the problem. So it's not just walking around, it, it, it's identifying where the problems are and dealing with them. Brilliant stuff. So um, this leads us to uh, the last couple of slides. Um, really what Al was talking about right at the, right at the beginning here. Um, certainly our experience definitely tells us you've got two broad ways you could think about transformation. Kaikaku, which is revolutionary transformation, sort of big scale transformation. Uh, or Kaizen, which is evolutionary, trans evolutionary transformation. Uh, we would always recommend um, evolution uh, over revolution. Um, there's a difference here between business agility and agile transformation. There are some extremely good um, people out there who talk about, you know, there's no such thing as agile, agile transformation or whatever the right word is. Uh, we should just continually evolve. Yeah, I sort of agree with that. However, what we need to do, business agility means the continuously, continuously improving business. We need to transform the business to get to the point that the business then takes off in a business agility way. So we need to change the business to make it a business, uh, make it business agile. So there is an element of change and transformation to get the business to operate in that way. And there's a comment here from Chris. Agree with all points, but often the leadership on the bigger picture orchestrating the supply chain 
is an afterthought when value stream wise this is critical absolutely totally agree probably the first thing that i've learned to do <laughs> when thinking about transformation of business is identify who the stakeholders are uh, rad tax define a stakeholder we have quite a unique view of stakeholders stakeholders are uh, people or groups who can help us or screw us up so it's identifying the people and groups who can help us or screw us up and then thinking about how to communicate and interact with those people in the most effective way a few more uh, values there our core values when thinking about business transformation systems thinking talked about this relying on value agile leadership over transactional traditional management yep making sure we act as leaders and then empowered people we've talked about before so we've already talked really about the top transformation lessons we've learned uh, al talked about that and um, just a few two here i'd like to um three here i'd like to just come into if i may two big plus two complex equals four failure and um, that is something we've learned the hard way um, you really do not want to do a transformation well any transformation in a big bang way uh, transformation is about kaizen it's about uh, uh, keeping it small keeping it realistic and showing value continuous value so two big plus time two complex equals four failure tempered radicals bottom left there we sort of talked about those before and then i'd just like to mention communication in radsac we talk about communication cued and that is listening persuading and fast feedback um, that brings me to the last slide. So we're just coming on to the end of the time box. Uh, so I'll hand back to Val in a few minutes. Um, in essence, uh, what we're talking about today was business agility, sort of like just a very high level of business agility. There's a lot more to this than what we just talked about. Business agility and leadership. A uh, question here from Roger. Ever asked the following question, uh, which fewest people changing, which narrow set of behaviors allows? Yeah, there's a concept called tipping point transformation. Um, tipping, tipping point transformation is, is this sort of stuff. So in essence, when we think about a change wave, we don't want the change wave to be too big because if it is too big, the chances are it will break uh, like a breaking wave that's too big um, and it's going to be next to impossible to start a change wave again. So we, we want to manage that change wave and we want to get that change wave to a point that we hit tipping point transformation. So a viral approach, as Al mentioned before, tipping point transformation basically means it's the point at which the whole organisation tips into this new way of working, the whole culture tips into a new way of working. So... We're right at the end. So we've just talked about introduction to business agility. Uh, yes, as Al was suggesting, I'm going to be doing a lot more of uh, agile leadership in the context of business agility. Uh, how leadership must change. What is lean agile leadership? Forms of power and influence. Forms of power and influence. Sorry. Uh, so basically, these are going to be on 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 all the Wednesdays for the next uh, the next uh, at least the next five weeks. There's myself and Al's um, email IDs. Please don't hesitate to contact us. It would be a pleasure to talk with you. And I'll hand back to Al now just to really um, uh, finish off our webinar. All righty. So bang on time, Pete. So thanks a million for that. Um, if there are any other kind of observations, that would be great. Um, next week, we are focused on uh, the... So, so we understand what business agility is. We understand what a healthy organizational context is. We understand what a great team looks like and the science behind that. And we even understand what an individual looks like. So the obvious question is, well, how do we how do we change? What are the mechanics behind change? And and it's and it sort of hints to Roger's question as well about well, what uh, what is the kind of the good nucleus of change? Um, what's the right size? What kind of behaviors and that kind of good stuff? So what I'm going to look at next week is um, he said raising his nuts is um, the whole process of change. And that is at the individual level, habit science and, and ha how change occurs and over what period of time, because there's some science behind that, believe it or not, uh, all the way through to the organizational level, uh, which is a little bit more system theory and social physics. And it will reinforce basically what we found over the last 22 plus years of trial and error. So next week is the last week for me but next week is the beginning of the first week for Pete. So there's a sort of a, a, a lovely kind of overlap there. So, and again, this is just about us putting positive stuff out in the world. Um, if it helps you, then fabulous. You'll remember us when you're, I don't know, CEO of a massive company and, um, you know, wins have an interest in dead famous. And you may, you may remember us back in the day. Um, so it's been a real joy. So thanks a million, Pete, for everything today. It's been brilliant. Um, if anyone needs any questions handled, we're happy to stick around for another few minutes and answer any questions. Um, 
Thanks for all the input as well. It's been brilliant. I think there's clearly a few people who have been around the traps and learned some great lessons, um, which is which is wonderful. And it's nice that um, that much of what we share is is in harmony with your own experiences in the world. Um, it, it means that we're we're kind of on the same page in trying to make the kind of positive impact we'd all love to see in the workplace. So if there are any other questions, type now or forever hold your peace. Thank you, David. All right, thanks a million, David. Lovely to have that. Sure. Brilliant, okay. If you need anything, you've got our email addresses. Some people have got in touch, which is great. Um, see you next week for you know the science of change. And then on that's on Thursday, but on Wednesday is is Pete's first workshop, which is really going to more detail on leadership because we you know I'm not covering leadership per se. Pete and I had a chat and thought, well, maybe we should do something about getting into more detail on that because that's it's a challenging topic. Uh, it's you know so so there you go. Right, Pete, I think we're all done. Thanks a million, everybody, for showing up as usual. Thanks again. Wish you all the best. Have a great rest of the week, and we'll see you next Wednesday and next Thursday. All the best, thanks. All right, take care, everybody.